let's turn in our Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. If, um, if you're just uh, jumping into this series, this is a series called Ready for His Return. Now I know most of you, if not all of you, are ready for Pastor Gary's return. This is talking about the return of Jesus, which um, I am ready for Pastor Gary's return as well, but I hope that even more so that we're prepared and ready for the return of Jesus. And uh, this is a very juicy chapter here in 1 Thessalonians 4. Pastor Tyler and Pastor Jimmy covered the first three chapters, so we're here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Going to be talking about the rapture of uh, the church tonight. What does that mean? Uh, When will that occur? Uh, But I hope you're ready to study God's Word uh, with me tonight. Um, And I hope that uh, those watching and joining us online, you have your Bibles open and you're ready to get into the nitty gritty of God's word. You ready to study God's word with me tonight, amen? Amen. All right, well, let's, let's, uh, let's pray. Let's ask the Lord to fill our hearts, to speak to us tonight, to teach us through his word. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to gather together to study your word. Lord, we love you. We give you all of the glory, all of the praise. After a long Wednesday in the middle of the week, God, I pray that you would quiet our hearts before you. You'd remove distractions away so that we might be able to hear from you tonight. That's why we're here, Lord, to hear from you and to learn from you through the pages of your word. So speak to us now by your Holy Spirit. Fill us afresh and anew with your spirit, Lord. May our minds instruct the heart tonight, Lord. May we learn something new or be reminded of something old And may it just fill our hearts with such joy and peace as we trust in you and pursue you and walk with you, Lord. We love you in Jesus' name and all God's people together said, amen. Amen. Um, If I I forgot to introduce myself, my name is Austin. I'm one of Pastor Gary's sons. I have the privilege and honor of studying the Bible with you tonight. So here we are in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And there are four questions, it being the fourth chapter. There are four questions that Paul is going to touch on in this chapter. Here are our four questions. Question number one, how do I please God? Oh my goodness, probably the most important question a believer can ask. How do I please the Lord? That's the first question we're going to touch on. Number two, how can I know the will of God? Oh, that is such a good question. I want to know the will of the Lord. Oh, this is great. This is a great Bible study tonight. Question number three we'll look at is how do I win the respect of unbelievers? Oh, it's a little boring, but you know, we'll get run, no, I'm kidding. That's a great question as well. And then question number four that Paul touches on obviously is how can I be ready for his return? That's uh, verses 13 through 18, and we'll close out the, the chapter uh, by touching on that question. The very fir- first question we'll look at is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 through 2, and we'll just walk through this chapter and we'll unpack it together. Chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, it says, finally then, this is Paul writing, he says, finally then. Now, every, everybody knows when a pastor uses that word finally, it doesn't mean he's necessarily done. But this word finally, it's a Greek word that more so doesn't mean Paul is done, but he's rather transitioning and he's entering into a new topic. He says, finally then, brothers, sisters, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. So the first question Paul's touching on is, how do I as a believer please the Lord? Now, it's very interesting. He actually begins this section the same way he ends this section. He says, finally, brothers, we urge and exhort. Everybody say exhort. It's a Greek word, parakaleo, and if you would just quickly peek at verse 18, the very last verse of this same chapter, in verse 18, he says, therefore, comfort, everybody say comfort, one another with these words. Exhort and comfort, two different English words in our English Bibles, but the same Greek word, parakaleo. Uh, It's a Greek word that means to come alongside, to comfort, and to counsel. This was the same word that Jesus used to describe the character and nature of the Holy Spirit in John 14. He said, the helper, the Holy Spirit, 
whom the Father will send in my name. He will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all things that I said to you. He says, this is the Holy Spirit, the helper who I will send to you. Helper, it's the same root word, parakletos, parakaleo. And so Paul, he kind of bookends this section by saying, listen, I I really want to um, comfort you with what I'm about to say. And the same comfort in which Paul wrote to the church there in Thessalonica is the same comfort we can receive today because it's the same parakletos, same Holy Spirit who inspired Paul to write these words. So what Paul's about to to say uh, should comfort us, counsel us, uh, his following section, this should uh, exhort us. Now, what is he urging us or exhorting us to do? Look at verse one, urging and exhorting in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more in what? Just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God. So what is Paul urging and exhorting the church at Thessalonica to do? He's urging them, he's exhorting them to live in such a way, to walk before the Lord in such a way that pleases him. Uh, This is where we kind of get this verbiage, um, a walk with the Lord. How's your walk with Christ going? Okay, this is a biblical uh, phrase. This is biblical terminology because Paul says, this is how you should walk before the Lord. Uh, uh, The Christian life is a walk. It is a journey with the Lord. And the same way you travel through life and it has hills and valleys and different obstacles, or if you're going on a hike and there's different tree branches in the way, uh, so goes our walk with the Lord. Sometimes you have rough days and sometimes the walk is rough. Sometimes the walk is smooth and easy. Be encouraged, be comforted. But he says, what I am urging you and what I'm encouraging you to do is church at Thessalonica, Cornerstone Chapel, as I'm, I want to exhort you to live your lives, to walk this Christian walk out in such a way that pleases the Lord. Now, how do I please the Lord as a believer? I think this is probably the most important question we as believers can ask, why? Because the nature and tendency of our humanness is to be people pleasers, man pleasers not God pleasers. And you will exhaust yourself in life if your main goal is to please people. The quickest way to burn out, the quickest way to physical burnout, spiritual burnout, emotional burnout, is when you seek to live your life pleasing other people. Because of the, fact, the fact of the matter is, no matter how hard we try to please people, we will never live up to the expectations that other people have. Uh, in a marriage, sometimes we go into marriage just having all of these expectations that we hope our spouses meet. And uh, we fail. We fail miserably at pleasing our spouse. But when our aim in life, when our aim in our marriages, when our aim at the workplace, when our aim generally as believers is, I'm going to fix my eyes on the Lord, I'm gonna work as unto the Lord and not as unto men, I'm going to live my life in such a way that pleases the Lord, that's my main aim, that is my higher calling as a believer. I'm going to to live my life to please the Lord, then in turn, guess what happens? I'm a better husband to my spouse, I'm a better husband to my wife at home, I'm a better dad to my kids at home, I'm a better employee in my ministry here, You are a a better employee at your work, a a better uh, spouse at home, a better dad to your kids, uh, when your main aim is to please the Lord. And that should be our main desire, is to live in such a way to please the Lord. Living for the Lord. And Paul actually, he points this out in this same book, but in 1 Thessalonians chapter two, He says in 1 Thessalonians chapter two, verses four through six, he says, he says, but we, but as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, 
but God who tests our hearts. For neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak for covetousness, God is witness, nor did we seek glory from men. So Paul, he, he kind of points this out throughout this book. He says, listen, when we first came to you, our, our desire was not to, to please you, not to have glory for ourselves or notoriety, but simply just to please the Lord. I just wanna be faithful to please the Lord. Is that you? You just wanna be faithful to please the Lord? You just wanna live in such a way that pleases the Lord? That's awesome, that should be your main goal. Now, you might say to me, Austin, I recognize that I'm a little bit of a people pleaser. Um, I, I strive to please people Um, but I recognize that as a weakness of mine, how can I please the Lord? And again, this is the best question a believer can ask. How can I please the Lord? Well, I want you to write down Romans 8.8. Write that down in the margin of your Bible as you're right here in 1 Thessalonians 4. If you're taking notes, uh, type it into the notes section in your phone. Write down Romans 8.8. You know what Romans 8.8 says? It says, so then, those who are in the flesh cannot please the Lord. Those who are in the flesh cannot please the Lord. What does it mean for a Christian to be in the flesh? I love what Pastor Chuck Smith, uh, Chuck Smith said about this. He says, to be in the flesh means to be living with your bodily appetite as the top priority in life. To be in the flesh means to be living with your bodily appetite as the top priority in life. What does it mean to be in the flesh? It means to be living for your own desires. Now again, you have to understand this. We're speaking in spiritual terms here. Uh, To live with your bodily appetite as the top priority, to be in the flesh, uh, we're not speaking literally, nor is Paul speaking literally in Romans 8, 8, where he says, if you are walking in the flesh, it is impossible to please the Lord. He's speaking in spiritual terms here. And uh, you have to know this, you have to grip, if, if you can grip this, this will be a game changer for you. Galatians 5.16, Paul talks about walking in the flesh and walking in the spirit. And in Galatians 5.16 he says, so I say then walk in the spirit so that you don't gratify the desires of your flesh. For the flesh wants what's contrary to the spirit and the spirit wants what's contrary to the flesh and these two are in conflict one another. Conflict, it's a Greek word that means to be at war with one another. Okay, so when you come into faith with Jesus Christ as a believer, which I hope you are, and if you're not a believer, if you've never given your life to the Lord, today's is the day of salvation. Give your life to Jesus Christ. It's the best day of your life. So, okay, now I'm talking to all believers in this room, right? Okay, so, as believers, when you come into relationship with Jesus Christ, the Bible says that God fills you with his Holy Spirit. You are now indwelt with the Holy Spirit. Paul says, do you not realize that your body is a temple unto the Lord? God resides in you by his Holy Spirit. So, as believers, you now have the Holy Spirit living in you, but wait a second. We still now live in these fleshly bodies that crave sinful things. We, we lust after the cravings of the flesh still. Just because we have the Holy Spirit living in us doesn't mean we shed these bodies of flesh. So now we have this war constantly raging within us. I have the appetite of the Spirit because I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, but I also have the appetite of the flesh because I, I know me and I, I, I crave after fleshly things. Now, I'm not talking about my dad's favorite donut, Krispy Kreme donut. Again, not talking literally. I'm talking in, this, in spiritual terms here. We lust after things that run contrary to God's moral standard. Pornography, cheating, lying, cutting corners, selfish ambition. Okay, the sin nature within us. So now we have these two opposing appetites. The appetite of the spirit, the appetite of the flesh. And Paul says, if you are walking in the flesh, meaning that your priority in life is to to fulfill the fleshly appetite, to indulge in the sin nature, if you are walking in the flesh, you cannot please God. It's impossible. Is anybody else challenged by that other than me? Paul says in Romans 8, 8, 
So then, for those of us who walk in the flesh, it is impossible to please God. So then, if it's impossible to please God by living after the appetite of the flesh, what does that mean? That the way to please God is to be constantly walking in the Spirit, feeding the appetite of the Spirit. How do you feed the appetite of the Spirit? You get in God's Spirit-inspired book. You get in the Word of God. You pray, you come to church, surround yourself with like-minded believers, you turn on worship music, you're filling your heart and your mind with spiritual nutrients, feeding the appetite of the Spirit. And while you are walking in the Spirit, but it's a constant thing. Okay, this is the walk with the Lord. Oh, it's a constant journey, it's a constant walk with the Lord. Do not be discouraged if you find one day, man, that was a day I was walking in the flesh. And then the next day, filled with the Holy Spirit, your desires to walk in the Spirit. Don't, don't be discouraged. Okay, this is, this is our, our, our journey with the Lord. But, but Paul's exhortation to us is, our goal in life should be to please the Lord. Therefore, it should be our ambition to be constantly, continually, daily, walking in the Spirit. I text with a, a pastor friend of mine, who our, our kind of running, joking text is, stay in the Spirit, stay in the Spirit. Stay in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. This is how you please the Lord. And the rest of that verse in Romans 8, 8 verses 9 now, Paul would say in Romans 8, 8, he says, so then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But verse 9 says, but you are not in the flesh, he says, but you are in the Spirit. So therefore, how can I please the Lord by walking in the Spirit. And the way you walk in the Spirit is to feed the appetite of the Spirit. That's what Galatians 6, 8 says. So I say then, uh, so to the Spirit reap everlasting life, so to the flesh and of the flesh reap destruction. So feed that nature of the Spirit, please the Spirit. Colossians 3, 5 says mortify your members. Your church members? No, mortify or put to death, mortifies the King James Version, put to death is uh, NIV, NLT, put to death your members. It's talking about your earthly nature. Put to death your earthly nature. And the way you put to death your earth earthly nature is by starving your uh, fleshly appetite. And the way you starve the fleshly appetite is by feeding the appetite of the spirit. Everybody get this, everybody with me? Mortify your members, put to death your earthly nature. It was Dr. J. Vernon McGee who said that the flesh is constantly trying to climb out of the coffin. And it's so true because you put to death your flesh and then it's constantly trying to climb out of the coffin. You put to death your flesh the next day. It's constantly trying to climb out of the coffin. So you gotta put more nails in the coffin by feeding the appetite of the spirit because the flesh is constantly creeping back. Oh, it's so frustrating. And one day we'll be in our glorified bodies and that's how Paul ends this chapter and no more wrestling with this sin nature. Cannot wait for that day. But in the meantime, the Bible says, continually be being filled with the Holy Spirit. And while you're walking in the Spirit, walking in step with the Spirit, you can please the Lord. Question number two we're gonna to touch on is verses three through eight. How can I know the will of God? So let's look at verse three. He says, for this is the will of God. Oh, this is awesome. He just lays it right out for us, right? Because so many times we ask the question, God, what is your will for my life? Lord, please, what is your will for my life? But this is where he just answers it. He's real clear and direct. No more like trying to read through parables or stuff. Like, you know, we, we just get it right here. He says, for this is the will of God. Okay, Paul, what is it? Your sanctification. Oh, boring. <laughs> oh, I was hoping it'd be something delightful. Oh, this is, I don't know why I'm going into that British mode. I love to do that when I kind of, uh, I have that like other voice in my head and for some reason it's British. I don't know why. For this is the will of the Lord. Oh, a, a nice new car. Oh, new treasures. Oh, Lord, I'd love new treasures. Please, my Lord. No, he says, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. What does that mean? Everybody say sanctification. sanctification. 
Okay, now he clarifies here that you should abstain from sexual immorality. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel. The NIV says, control his own body in sanctification and honor. Verse five, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter. Because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. Okay, so he uses that word. This is the will of God, what your sanctification. Sanctification, it's a Greek word, hagiosmos. And he uses that word three times in these few verses, hagiosmos, and it translates holy. He uses that word in verse three, sanctification, verse four, and in verse seven. In verse seven, it says holiness, but it's the same Greek word. It's this Greek word, hagiosmos, and it, it literally translates uh, holiness. So this is God's will for you. You wanna know God's will for your life? Be holy before the Lord. Now what does that word holy or sanctification mean? It, it means literally to, to be different, uh, to be set apart, to be unique. Uh, just as the sun in our solar system, there's nothing like the sun in our solar system. It's different, it's unique. Uh, so is to be the believer. We are called to be different and unique, set apart from the rest of the world. If you and your lifestyle and your behavior, your speech, your attitude looks like the rest of the world, that is not good. Because we as believers, we're called to be distinct. We're called to be different. Uh, we're called to be set apart. We're called to be holy. And Paul says the way that the Christian, in context of the verses we just read, is supposed to look different is in regards to how you use your body. He says, this is the will of God for your life, to be sanctified, how? To be sexually pure, to avoid sexual immorality. The word sexual immorality is the Greek word pornea, it's where we get our English word pornography. And the Greek word, it's, it's a much broader term that just simply means to act in a sexually immoral way. Now, how do we know what is sexually immoral? Well, by asking the question, what is God's design for sexual expression? And all throughout the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, the Bible is clear that sexual expression and sexual experiences are to be reserved for marriage, heterosexual marriage between one man and one woman. That's the Bible's definition for what is sexually permissible. Heterosexual uh, sexual experiences within the confines of a marriage between one man and one woman. So outside of that, that would be what the Bible would define as sexually, uh, sexual immorality. And so he says that you should abstain from sexual immorality. Uh, sex outside of marriage. Uh, this is God's will for you. This is God's will for your life. This is how Paul answers that question. Now there's four different times in the New Testament where the Bible actually uses that phrase, this is God's will for you, this is God's will for you, this is God's will for you. The first time we see it is in John 6:40. It says, and this is the will of God, that everyone who sees Jesus and believes in him may have eternal life. So what is God's will? That you believe in Jesus, John 6, 40. We see this again in 1 Thessalonians 4. God's will is that you should abstain from sexual immorality. We see it again in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, the very next chapter in verse 18. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus, that we give thanks in all things. And then finally in 1 Peter 2.15, it says, it is God's will that your honorable lives should silence those ignorant people who make foolish accusations against you. God's will is that you live honorably with other people. 
Now, what I find so interesting is that so many of us are more concerned with understanding God's unrevealed will for us than we are about pursuing God's revealed will for our lives. What do I mean by this? Okay, God has an unrevealed will for your life and God has a revealed will for your life. God's unrevealed will for your life are some of those questions that the Bible doesn't necessarily directly answer with chapter and verse. Questions like, what's the name of my future spouse? Where should I work? Should I take that job promotion? Should I move to this area? Okay, those are questions that the Bible doesn't necessarily answer with chapter and verse. This is a part of God's unrevealed will for your life, where the Bible doesn't necessarily directly answer those questions. I know some of us, Often we go to the Bible to learn God's unrevealed will, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but sometimes this is kind of what what we do, is we just peruse through the Bible and say, okay, Lord, I'm praying for a spouse, and Lord, what's the name of my future spouse? Samuel, I'm here in 1 Samuel. Okay, Lord, send me a Samuel. Send me a Samuel. Okay, what will his job be? Job, job, job. Okay, book of Job, he doesn't have a job, okay. Great, I'm back at square one. What is going on, Lord? Okay, but we're trying to find chapter and verse to answer questions about God's unrevealed will for our life. Okay, then God has a revealed will for your life. What he's already outlined and revealed to us in the pages of the Bible. This being one of them. Abstain from sexual immorality. This is the will of God for your life. Okay, why do we do this? where sometimes we think that God is obligated to answer all of the questions we have about his unrevealed will for our lives when we're already not obeying what God has revealed to us in his word. I've done that. But we are constantly anxious about God answering all of the questions I have about his unrevealed will. And my question to you would be, well, Let's make sure that we're already falling in line with what God has already revealed to us in the pages of his word. It would be like, for example, if you, let's say that you're someone's boss or you're someone's manager at your workplace, and you told your employer, uh, your your employee, to uh, put in um, that uh, supply order. Say, hey, uh, can you... Okay, so you're someone's boss or manager, okay? Hey, uh, can you uh, put in that supply order for me? And let's say that that person, after you've already told them time and time again, let's say that person continues to ignore your instructions. Time and time again, day after day, hey, did you put in that supply order? No, I, no, I forgot. Okay, put in that supply order for me. Could you do that? Yeah, I'll do that, okay. You check on them the next day. Hey, did you put in that supply order for me? No, you know, I forgot. And then this is what they say to you. Hey, but I did uh, email you about that raise, uh, but you didn't answer my question. Um, Why not? Your natural response would be, um, hey, before I answer the question about your job promotion, about your raise, um, how about you just already fall in line with the instruction I gave you? Did you put that job, uh, that supply order in? Um, I will now. Okay, so... We do the same thing with the Lord, where we, we, we don't already fall in line with God's revealed will in his word, and yet we're constantly wondering, why is God silent and not answering all my questions about my future? Okay, let's make sure that we're falling in line and being obedient to God's revealed will in the pages of the Bible, and then God will be gracious to guide and direct our steps toward his unrevealed will. And this is what Paul is saying uh, in this passage, answering this question, how can I know the will of God? Well, it's by following what God has already revealed to us in the pages of his word, and in the context of 1 Thessalonians chapter four, verses three through eight, he says, the will of God for your life is to be sexually pure, to abstain from sexual immorality. Question number three, we'll race through this question. How do I win win the respect of unbelievers? Verses nine through 12. He says, but concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. And indeed, you do so toward all the brothers who are in all Macedonia. So he's saying, you're you're doing this one thing really well. You're loving all of the fellow believers. But we urge you, brothers, brethren, that you increase more and more. So keep on doing that. Verse 11, 
that you also aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your own hands, as we commanded you, that you may walk properly toward those who are outside and that you may lack nothing. Now, when he says outside that you may walk properly toward those who are outside, he's talking about unbelievers, those who are outside of the faith. So how do I win the respect of unbelievers? Paul, number one, he says, lead a quiet life. And this is a way, Paul says, potentially that you can win the respect of outsiders. We have become a society that is so noisy noisy is a very good word, (laughs) distracted, caught up in entertainment, being constantly entertained, wanting notoriety, wanting to be seen, and social media has made that very easy. We're now You can post your best life now, and we receive uh, dopamine hits chemically in the brain by the amount of likes we now receive on social media. And we are addicted now to entertainment and the thrill and the excitement of it all. And what I love about what Paul says here, what what I think that we are missing is leading a quiet life before the Lord. Um, Getting alone with the Lord and getting off of our phones and our phones wrong, our phones bad, is social media wrong? By no means, we use all of those platforms here at Cornerstone, but we have neglected the discipline of waiting on the Lord and that starts uh, in the quiet life, the hidden life where no one else sees but you and the Lord. And it's a discipline that we need to get back to. And Paul says, lead a quiet life before the Lord. And he says then, he says, also a way that you earn respect is you uh, mind your own business and you work with your own hands. He says, don't be nosy, Um, work hard. And listen, when, when, when you're not nosy and you work hard at the job office and you get there on time and you stay late and you're dependable, Uh, this is going to win the respect of outsiders. And so I'm gonna leave it at that. There's so much more to say, but I need, in the short amount of time we have, I need to answer this fourth question because this is the best question of the whole chapter and I'm already so out of time here. Question number four, how can I be ready for his return? Verses 13 to 18. He says, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brothers, concerning those who have fallen asleep. Okay, this is a euphemism for uh, death. I don't want you to be ignorant concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep, or those who are dead, in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Amen? So this is what Paul says. He says, we don't grieve like those who have no hope. This is a very, uh, this is so important for us to understand as believers because some of you have lost loved ones and you are very close with them. Um, If they knew Jesus Christ, we have hope. You will see them again. They are with the Lord. Their spirits are with him. And we have this hope, Paul says, that we, we don't grieve like those who are outside of the faith. We have a hope. We're going to see our loved ones again. And he continues on to kind of explain this mystery here. He says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Now, notice here uh, in verse 17, this is a key verse. He says, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. Everybody say caught up. 
this is where we get the doctrine of the rapture. How many of you have heard of the rapture? Okay, so this is a prominent passage in the Bible that addresses this biblical fact. There will be a day, the Bible says, no man knows the day or the hour. The Bible is clear on that. But there will be a day when Jesus will return in the clouds, okay? He will return in the clouds and believers will be caught up or raptured to meet the Lord in the air and then will be taken with Jesus in heaven. This is called the rapture. Now you won't find the word rapture in your Bibles, but there where it says caught up, I had you say that phrase, caught up, it's a Greek word harpazo. And it, in the Latin, is rapio. It's where we get our English word rapture. And the Bible says that we will, for those who are alive and remain, for those who have not yet died, there will be a generation of believers who don't experience death, where we will be caught up in the air to meet the Lord. Jesus will meet us in the air, will be caught up, and will return to be with the Lord. This is the same Greek word harpazo used in Acts chapter eight when it talks about how Philip, remember Philip? He was sharing the gospel with the Ethiopian eunuch. After he baptized the Ethiopian, okay, the Ethiopian gets saved, he baptizes the Ethiopian. It says that Philip is caught up. It's the same Greek word harpazo. He's raptured, he's caught away, and he's transported to a city 30 miles away. To be caught up, it's this Greek word that means to be seized away, to be carried off, to be violently, violently snatched away. This is the hope of believers. Now, this is what's gonna happen to the church. There will be, again, a generation of believers who don't experience death. There were two people, quick trivia, two people in the Bible who didn't experience death in the Old Testament. Anybody know? Enoch and Elijah. Okay, my dad promised 50 bucks to the person who got that right. I'm totally kidding, just kidding. You're right, exactly. Enoch and Elijah didn't experience death in the Old Testament. They were caught up to be with the Lord. So this is extremely awesome, but the Bible also notes here in verses 15 and 16 that there's an order to this process. Notice in verse 15. He says, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. Again, those who are already dead and gone to be home with the Lord. He goes on in verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. Okay. What is Paul saying here? There's an order to these events. When he says that the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up. What he's saying is this, who are the dead in Christ? The dead in Christ are the believers who have already died. The believers who are already died, their bodies first will be resurrected. They will receive a glorified body and their glorified body will be reunited with their spirits. Okay, everybody get this. Everybody who, who is a believer who has already passed away, their body goes to be in the ground, but their spirit separates and goes on to be with the Lord in heaven. There are no physical bodies in heaven currently other than Jesus currently has a glorified body. But everyone currently in heaven now who has died as believers, their, their spirit is in heaven. Their bodies are in the grave. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 8, that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Okay, everybody following me? So when you die, your body goes in the grave, in the ground, your spirit separates, goes on to be with the Lord. The dead in Christ will rise first, meaning that those who have already died, who are believers in Jesus, their physical bodies will rise They'll receive a glorified body, and that body will now be reunited with their spirit. So he says the dead in Christ will rise first. That event will happen. They'll be reunited with their spirit. Then we who are alive and remain, believers who are alive still, we will be caught up with them to meet the Lord in the air. This is called the rapture. This is so awesome. This is so exciting. Now, how do we know that the dead in Christ 
and those who are alive and remain who are caught up. How do we know that we'll all receive these glorified bodies? Well, this is where first, I want you to write down 1 Corinthians 15. We're wrapping up here because I'm over time. This is where 1 Corinthians 15 verses 50 through 59 comes into play. Now listen to this, check this out. He says, now this I say, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, same terminology here, at the trumpet sound, as Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall all be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So Paul explains this mystery that wasn't revealed in the Old Testament, that we will all be changed physically in the twinkling of an eye where the dead in Christ will rise first, their new glorified body reunited with their spirit, and then at the rapture, those who are alive will receive their glorified body on the way up, be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, to be with the Lord forever. Okay, this is a beautiful promise. Now, why do we as Christians, why do we as believers, why do, why do Cornerstone specifically, why do we believe that this will all take place before the seven-year tribulation? Okay, there's a lot of different reasons, okay? Because you have to think of Jesus' return as coming in two different phases. Phase one is the rapture. Jesus returns to the air. We're caught up to meet with the Lord in the air. Go back to be with the Lord in heaven. This is phase one of Jesus' return. Then the seven-year period of tribulation happens. A period of agony and God's wrath poured out on the earth for a period of seven years. Following that seven-year tribulation, is the second phase of Jesus' return, also known as the second coming, where Jesus, with his saints, with us as believers, will return all the way to the earth. The Bible prophesies in Zechariah 14, Jesus returns to the Mount of Olives, where he will then finally judge wickedness and set up his millennial kingdom, set up his earthly reign for a thousand years, called the millennial reign. So his return is two phases. The rapture of the church, where Jesus comes in the air, Then the seven-year tribulation. Following that, Jesus comes all the way to the earth to finally judge wickedness, set up his earthly kingdom. Why do we believe that this phase one, which is what Paul is referring to in 1 Thessalonians 4, the rapture, why do we believe that happens before the seven-year tribulation? A lot of reasons, but primarily reason number one. God's people were never intended to experience God's wrath. And this is exactly what the tribulation is all about. It's a seven year period where God's wrath is poured out on the world. Why? As a last wake up call to an unbelieving world, to give them a taste of God's judgment that will be further experienced in the lake of fire. The seven year tribulation is a last wake up call to an unbelieving world. God pours out his wrath, but we know that God's people were never intended to experience God's wrath. Why? The very next chapter, which we'll touch on next week, 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, still writing in the context of Christ's return, says, for God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, God never assigns his people, his bride, to wrath. That's contrary to God's character. We see this in the Old Testament with Noah. God saved a righteous few, Noah and his family, in the ark, and they didn't experience God's wrath, the flood. Same with Lot and his family. God pulled Lot, a righteous few, out of the city of of Sodom and Gomorrah before the city of Sodom and Gomorrah experienced God's wrath for their sin. All throughout the Bible we see this, that God's people never were intended to experience his wrath. And we see this again in Revelation 3.10, 
where Jesus is speaking to the faithful church and he writes, because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. And this is exactly why he closes out the book in verses seven, or the chapter in verses 17 through 18. Be comforted by these words, church. You won't experience God's wrath if you're walking with the Lord. And we will experience one day a generation that doesn't experience death, but is taken away to be with the Lord forever. This is the hope we have, church. I've, I've gone so over time, but I, I wanna highlight these three books. If you have more questions on the rapture and times, um, the Book of Signs by Dr. J David Jeremiah, it's a great read. If you wanna really go in depth with the rapture question, the book is called The Rapture Question. It's by John F. Wolverd, great read. Uh, and then Dr. Ed Heinsen, who's gone on to be with the Lord, one of my professors at Liberty, it's called Future Glory, Living in the Hope of the Rapture, Heaven and Eternity. Great reads to further your study on the rapture of the church. I hope that you were encouraged uh, by these words as the church at Thessalonica was 2,000 years ago. Father God, I pray that your blessing would be upon your people. May you be with them, Lord. May we continue to be comforted by your words, Lord, that we will one day experience life with you eternally. We love you, God. I pray your blessing upon your people. For my brothers and sisters, may you bless them and fill them full with your Holy Spirit that we may all live to please you, Lord, with our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you guys. I love you. Have a great week.